so many YouTube true crimers have come out and said that it looks like she's scared of someone, like she's hiding from someone, like she's fearful. That's actually not true. What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel and if you are new here, welcome to my channel and welcome to another True Crime Sunday. Now, earlier on in the week, I actually told you guys that I was doing this particular case and asked you what you thought about it because it is a particularly well-known case, but it is a mystery. It's unsolved. So, oh well, unsolved. A lot of you guys surprisingly said that you thought it was either an accident or that it was a suicide. And I know that the tables have turned. Coming from someone who can usually figure out logical explanations for things, I have a lot of questions. And that's why I've decided to do the Elisa Lamp case today. Now, for those of you who said that you thought there was a logical explanation for those things, I would love to see what you guys think. I don't know if you know all of the stuff that I know about this case, but um, it'd be interesting to see exactly what, you know, if we can cross notes and if you can have... Uh, if you can explain away some of the things that I've got questions about, that would be really interesting. Or let me know if you didn't know some of the things that I've said today. I think the really alluring part of this case is the fact that I don't see there being any sort of resolve anytime soon. Now, Elisa was a 21-year-old Canadian college student. She was staying in the Cecil Hotel. That's actually where we're going to start our journey today. We're going to be talking about the Cecil Hotel, and I think this is another aspect as of why the Elisa Lamb case has blown up so big. I think had this happened in any other establishment, it probably wouldn't have gotten the coverage that it did, and it probably wouldn't have so many questions around this case. It wouldn't have so much of a spooky kind of aura around the Elisa Lamb case had it happened in like a Marriott or something like that. The Cecil Hotel is known to be one of the most haunted hotels in LA. That's because there's been so many murders, so many suicides, so many unexplained deaths, as well as so many paranormal experiences. Also, the crazy amount of serial killers who have stayed in the Cecil Hotel. So, William Banks Hanna was the man who actually built the Cecil Hotel. It was built in the 1920s, so in 1924, and it was originally built with the idea that it was going to be this prestigious, you know, place for elite businessmen to come, and it was going to be this, like, place where all the high rollers went. But unfortunately, in the time that it actually opened its doors, uh, I think it was around four years later, it, the Great Depression hit and it became Skid Row, what we know now as Skid Row, where junkies, homeless people, criminals, lots of murderings, murderings, <laughs> lots of murders happen in Skid Row. And unfortunately, by the time that they opened their doors, this had hit. So you've got this magnificent hotel. It's got 700 rooms. There's palm trees inside. There's stained glass windows, marble inside, this like extravagant staircase. And unfortunately, it's in a part of town that is uh, not that great. And so it's kind of this strange juxtaposition. The grand opening was in 1927. And ever since then, the Cecil Hotel has been home to so many murders, so many suicides, so many strange things. And we'll talk about the strange, because there's a lot of weird things that happen in this hotel. So within the first 10 years of William opening his hotel, there were six suicides. One woman jumped out of the window or fell out of the window and she was caught by tele telegraph telephone poles, like the wires in the telephone poles and they wrapped around her and um, she went to hospital and she died. Another woman, Dorothy Purcell, would wake up in the middle of the night while staying at the Cecil Hotel. She woke up because she had really strong pains in her stomach and she was with a partner. They didn't say that, that this man was her husband, so I don't know. She went into the bathroom and sat on the toilet and had a baby and she didn't even know she was pregnant. Nobody knew she was pregnant but she gave birth to this baby. And because she was so confused, um, it kind of made her a little bit crazy. She thought the baby was dead. And so she threw it out the window. 
there was a murder trial for this particular case, but she was found not guilty due to reasons of insanity. She wasn't insane before this point. Um, she stayed in the Cecil Hotel, had a random baby. Nobody knew she was pregnant. She went crazy and threw it out the window. Another woman would have an argument with her partner. When her partner left the room, she threw herself out the window. Just as somebody was walking past this Cecil Hotel, they were squished by this falling woman and both of them died on impact. There was another woman who was retired and she was known for feeding the birds in a nearby place called Perishing Square. She would be found murdered, raped, stabbed, strangled, and there was like a bag of bird seed next to her and someone was arrested for it, but it turned out he wasn't the man and no one has been arrested for that murder. Those are probably just the strangest amongst the murders or suicides or happenings that have gone on in the Cecil Hotel, but since their opening, they've had 16 separate deaths. Like, not just, I'm old, I'm sick, I'm dying, but 16 unnatural before your time deaths. Now, if you haven't heard of the Black Dahlia murder, then you need to have a look at that. That's probably one of the most famous true crime cases that is still unsolved. The Black Dahlia was actually, her name was Elizabeth Short, and she was seen in the Cecil Hotel a few days before she was brutally murdered. And if that wasn't enough to tell you that the Cecil Hotel is a very strange place, Richard Ramirez stayed in the Cecil Hotel in 1985. If you don't know who Richard Ramirez is, he's the Night Stalker, probably another one of the world's most infamous serial killers. And apparently when he would kill someone, he would throw his clothes in the dumpster because they were all bloodied, and he would just walk into the Cecil Hotel half naked, and no one would bat an eye. Another infamous serial killer who I cannot pronounce his last name, it's like Jack Utwinger. I, I'm horrible at this kind of stuff. I, I read the word, I know the word, but I can't say the word. But um, he was an infamous serial killer uh, and he also stayed at the Cecil Hotel. He was known for strangling women with their own bras. But in 2011, the Cecil Hotel tried to shake their reputation of serial killers, unnatural deaths and murders um, by attempting to refurbish the place. They signed a 99 year lease and started doing a basically an inside gutting of the place to make it foncier and um, try and rid the reputation of all of the strange happenings. Elisa Lamb would not be the last person to go missing and be found dead in the Cecil Hotel. That happened in 2013. The last one happened just a few years ago in 2015. But we are going to go all the way back to 2013 because this is the case that we have the most amount of information on. And it is weird information. We are gonna be talking about the Elisa Lamb case in depth today. Everything that I have found on the Elisa Lamb case. So as we know, Elisa was a Canadian student. She studied the University of British Columbia. It was on January 26th that she arrived by Amtrak train to LA from San Diego. This was supposed to be a little vacation for her. She wanted to go traveling. Her family were like, absolutely not. You can't go on your own. But after a little bit of persuasion, they let her go on her own. And so here she is. She has arrived in LA and she decides to stay at the Cecil Hotel. But because her family did not want her traveling alone, she would be checking in with her family every single day. She would be emailing or telephoning her family. But on January 31st, the day that Elisa was supposed to check out of the Cecil Hotel, she would disappear and no one would ever hear from her again. When her family didn't receive an email or a call from Elisa, they were frantic and they contacted the LAPD because they just knew that something was not right. And so the LAPD went to the Cecil Hotel, checked her room and nobody heard from her. Because this case was considered an international case, the police did pay a lot of attention to it. And also because it was the Cecil Hotel, I think that might have um, also been a big reason as to why they acted the way that they did on this case. 
So they released some security footage from the last time Elisa was ever seen on tape. But there's a lot of strange things that are happening on this tape. And this is where all the conspiracies started. So the security footage shows Elisa in the Cecil Hotel's elevator and she is acting strange. The video has gone viral, it's got tens of millions of views and this is what it looked like. But just note that what you are seeing is not exactly what happened and we will talk about that later on but this is what the footage shows. It would be two weeks later that residents would complain about a funny taste in their water. They would also complain that their water pressure was extremely low and so the hotel would send up their maintenance worker to go and check on the roof where they had these huge water tanks. And when Santiago Lopez, the maintenance worker, would go and check one of these huge drums of water, he would see Elisa Lam lying face up in the water, completely naked and lifeless. To get Elisa out of the water system, they actually had to drain it fully and cut a huge square out of the side of the water tank. These were huge water tanks, mind you. When they drained the tank, they saw that her clothes were still with her. They were next to her, as were her keys and her watch. However, her cell phone was the only thing that was missing. Now, Elisa was alone at the hotel. There was no one seen with her in her last moment. And she was said to have been alone for the majority of the time that she stayed there. So there wasn't anyone that anybody knew that she was seeing or meeting up with or anything like that. And in her last moment, she was on her own. One person, however, would say that they saw her. This would be a bookstore clerk. And they said that they saw Elisa earlier that day and she was planning on leaving. She was actually buying books and music to bring back as gifts for her family. So Elisa definitely had solid plans of leaving that day. Now here's the thing about this case. 
A lot of people think that it was a mental health disorder because when her toxicology report came back, she had bipolar medication in her system. There was absolutely no drugs in her system. There was no alcohol. Some people report that there was a slight amount of alcohol, but there were only trace amounts of alcohol, nothing that would lead to her death or nothing that would really be a red flag in this situation. Nothing that would be like, oh, she's drunk. You know what I'm saying? They were like literally minute, but she did have her antidepressants in her system. The thing is, she did take her antipsychotic, but she hadn't taken it that day. The toxicology report said that she had taken it recently, but not on that day. So she had her antidepressants in her system. And something that happens when you don't take your sedative, which I take bipolar medication um, and if you are treating bipolar with just antidepressants uh, that can actually cause mania and so a lot of people explain this away by saying that she's just manic. Another thing that I will mention in this case is that Elisa was staying with a, a, a group of people at the Cecil Hotel because the Cecil Hotel isn't just for permanent residents, it's also for hotel guests. You can share rooms with people and Elisa was doing that but she actually had to be moved to her own private room because the people she was staying with were complaining about her. They just said that she was odd. Another thing to note is that although we do have the autopsy and toxicology report, we don't have a full blood read because they couldn't get a good sample and so it might be easy to just explain this away as like she's just had a manic episode and that's why she's acting the way that she's acting on the surveillance tapes. The surveillance tapes aren't showing you exactly what had happened in the way that it happened. And we will talk about that in a second, but I want you to actually think about how she would have gotten from the 14th floor elevator onto the roof, onto the drum, into the drum. She was a small framed five foot four woman. These drums are almost more than double her height. In addition, the hotel do not keep their ladders to the drums in that area and also there's no internal or external ladder of these water systems. So the Lamb family would actually try and sue the Cecil Hotel and in this lawsuit proceeding, the maintenance man from earlier actually testified and said just how hard it would have been for Elisa to get in to the water tank from the 14th floor and just from any floor. He said that you can't actually just go up to the roof. He said that it is secured with an alarm system. She would have had to have gotten to the 15th floor. She would have had to have gone up a flight of stairs and reached the exit. And she also would have had to have disarmed the alarm system, which normal people don't know how to do. Only hotel security, hotel maintenance, and hotel staff know how to disarm this alarm. And he also said that had this alarm had gone off, it would have been loud enough to reach the first top two floors, and it would have also reached the front desk. He said that had she figured out how to disarm the alarm, that sounds so funny, I'm so sorry. Had she figured out how to disarm the alarm, she would have then had to have gone up to the, like on a separate platform on the roof. And then she also would have had to have found a ladder because they don't keep a ladder there. And it's also not attached to the outside or the inside of the tank. She would have had to have then lifted the lid, gotten into the tank and somehow closed the lid behind her. Now, remember when I said that Elisa Lamb is 5'4 and the tank is double her height and there's no internal ladder for the tank. Another thing that I'll mention is that the tank was only like, it wasn't even halfway full, which means that if she got into that tank, she would have fallen straight down and she wouldn't have been able to close the lid behind her because the maintenance man said that while the hatch to you know, the hatch that would secure the lid to the drum wasn't secured. He did say that the lid to the drum was closed. The only other way that Elisa Lam would have been able to have gotten to the roof is by climbing up the fire escape. But even if she found a way to climb up the fire escape to the roof, which mind you, this is a 15 floor building. She would have then had to, have, as I said, 
gotten up to the platform where the water systems are on the roof as well as finding a ladder to get on top of these ginormous water systems as well as getting into the water system and closing the lid behind her. Not only is it really strange that Elisa was found naked, it's also strange that her clothes were found next to her, which means that had she have just decided that she didn't want to live anymore, which the family dispute, she's never had a suicidal attempt before, she was bipolar but she wasn't that way inclined. She, she'd never had a scare like that before. It's very unlikely that she would have undressed herself and taken her clothes and her belongings, climbed up somehow into the drum without a ladder, gotten into it and then just brought her clothes with her. Another thing that is also really scary about this case is that there was sand all through her clothes. I did see one person on a forum trying to explain away the sand by saying that when she managed to climb up on top of the water tank that you know when you are scared of heights kind of and you climb up something and then you kind of use your body to pivot yourself and then drop yourself so that your legs are the first thing that fall. That might make sense had this been a cement water system, but it was not cement. It was actually a, it looks to be like a tin or a plastic kind of thing. And so there wouldn't have been that much sand, if any sand, on top of this system. It would make more sense for her to have been either laying on her back or on her stomach with her clothes on. On a sandy surface, and she would have need to have been either struggling on that surface to get that much sand through her clothing as well as or or even just rubbing herself against the floor this of this sandy surface to get that much sand in her clothes another thing to note about her autopsy which i probably should have mentioned earlier but i'm mentioning it now is that there was actually blood found in her anal region so another commenter said that it's possible that she was sodomized on the roof and whoever did this to her dumped her in there and threw her clothes in there as well as well as her belongings and just keeping her phone so that nobody could trace it or so that she couldn't call anyone or so that it might be harder for her to be identified. They did actually do a rape kit, but they never processed it. There is no evidence to suggest that this rape kit was ever processed. There's also part of her toxicology report missing, and this case is just very strange because no one even attempted to find her phone. No one's traced it, no one's tracked it, no one's seen where it was last pinged. Um, it's kind of like this case just dropped off. A lot of people also say that the lid may have closed behind her, but the thing is about this particular lid is that it is not hinged. It would make sense for the door to just close, slam behind her, had it have had hinges, but this is a lid that you have to actually move off the top of the thing to actually get in there, and then you would have to move it back. So this is not something that you can do from the inside, especially if you are drowning, dead, or trying to commit suicide, especially because the tank was only partially full. She would not have even been able to climb halfway up the tank. There was no ladder in there and there's just no way that she'd be able to close this lid on her own while she's in there. Now remember when I said that the footage that you're seeing, the footage that they released is actually not a good representation or even an accurate representation of what had happened that night. Some people say that the 24th minute on this tape is actually missing. There has been analysis done on the footage and it's been proven that whoever released this footage or whoever had access to the footage before it was released actually slowed it down. Now think about it. If I'm doing anything and you slow my movements down, I'm going to look way more bizarre than what I would have looked like in real time in real motion. Because a lot of people have noticed that there is actually time missing from this footage, they're saying that the reason that the footage was slowed down is to fill in that time, to make it seem like no time is missing. Other people say that they slowed down this footage to make her look stranger or crazy or whatever, because this case was closed, saying that it was death 
from like because she was bipolar. There are also some really weird things that were happening around the Cecil Hotel as this was happening. There was actually a study for a drug for tuberculosis like right near the Cecil Hotel and guess what they named this drug? They named the drug Lamb Dash Elisa. That's weird. This wasn't after Elisa Lamb died. This was at the time that Elisa Lamb was in the Cecil Hotel. It's literally the same spelling. It's literally L A M dash E L I Lisa. E oh my god. You know what I'm saying. It's the same spelling. It's literally her last name, dash Elisa. And then if that wasn't weird enough for you, the bookstore that she was at the day that she was supposed to check out of the Cecil Hotel, the day that she went missing, guess what the name of that bookstore is? It's literally called The Last bookstore. There was also a website that was associated associated with the Cecil Hotel. It was a company called the Invisible Light Company and they had the same address as what the Cecil Hotel's address was and when you typed in their website which suddenly disappeared, that's the address that they said that they were at and now it's gone. The Invisible Light Company is gone. I know that I'm sounding crazy right now, but the word Cecil actually means blind. So, blind, the Invisible Light. I don't know. That's probably way more conspiracy theorist than I planned on getting, but I just think that's interesting to note. I think it's really interesting to note that her last and first name was the name of a drug that was being developed in that area. Just weird, I don't know, but there's way more weird stuff and we're about to go down the rabbit hole. A lot of people have brought up the fact that the Cecil Hotel have not released any footage from the hallways, any footage from anywhere apart from the elevator. And the Cecil Hotel said that, and this is super strange, that while this was happening, the entire floor that Elisa was on, their cameras malfunctioned. There is absolutely zero footage of Elisa Lam apart from the elevator footage. Another thing is that the footage timestamp is all messed up. Some people say it's because the Cecil Hotel is super old and maybe they haven't digitalized, digitalized their footage and so they had to convert the tape to a digital version for the police to be able to release it and maybe in doing that the timestamp got all muddled up, but other people have noted that the entire reason a timestamp exists is so that surveillance footage can be used in a court of law and it's not just inserted on top of the screen, it's usually inserted uh, within different parts of the footage, as in like the audio, um, it's programmed into like just different parts so that the timestamp is always there. It, the technology for CCTV footage is different to the camera that I'm recording on right now. So the timestamp should still be legit because literally pieces of evidence involving timestamps that have been muddled up have been thrown out because they're not reliable. So the entire reason that a timestamp exists is so that it can be used in a court of law and so that it can be reliable because that is also another reason why CCTV footage exists in the first place. So a lot of people say that this timestamp has been purposefully muddled up so that you can't see that there is missing time within the footage. Another reason why they might not want you to know the timestamp is because it is slowed down a lot. I think that it's interesting that people have actually analyzed this footage and confirmed that it has been slowed down, but no one from the police and no one from the hotel has actually come out and explained why that is. Because if you think about it, if you've been caught out because you've slowed down footage, a really easy explanation, or at least a, a thing that I can imagine the police doing, is coming out and being like, oh, we slowed it down because we wanted it to be clear. We slowed it down because we wanted you to get a more of a look of Elisa and what she looked like. But nobody has come out and addressed this, and that's even stranger than the reason as to why they might have slowed it down so much, because she looks very strange because she's been slowed down so much. It was a 
pretty short time after this was released that people started analyzing this video. So before anybody knew that it had been slowed down so much, a body language analyst company came out with their analysis on her body language. And I think it's really interesting because so many YouTube true crimers have come out and said that it looks like she's scared of someone, like she's hiding from someone, like she's fearful. That's actually not true because these guys came out with some pretty interesting findings and I'm gonna actually read it to you while showing you the footage. When she originally enters the elevator, she looks like she is relaxed. She moves to the back of the elevator and her stance is neutral. Then when she goes to look out of the elevator, she looks left to right before moving into the left corner of the elevator near the button. Her hands then move in to the fig leaf configuration and her feet move together which would indicate anxiety but not fear. And also I will note here, which didn't come from the body language analyzer person, but I watched a video from John Lorden, John, John Lorden Arts, and he said that it actually looks like she's waiting in the corner because she thinks someone's going to come around the corner so that she can scare them. You know when you're like, oh they're coming, I'm going to, I'm going to hide and you know that's kind of what it looks like and i thought i would note that because i tend to agree so then she jumps out of the elevator playfully and suddenly and her feet stance is wide which would indicate confidence her hands are still in the fig leaf configuration and this is not consistent with fear so the next part's actually pretty interesting there's a 16 second time slot where she's playing with her hair um, both of her elbows are up to her head. She's, they call it hair preening, which would indicate sexual interest. So the analysis stated that the person she was interested in was either outside of the elevator or she was actively thinking about that person at the time. Again, I'm going to mention John Lorden's video um, because he said that she, she may have met someone at the bar that night and she was probably thinking about him or he might have even been just outside the elevator in the hallway where we can't see him and that's why she's like fixing her hair, playing with her hair, doing that hair preening thing that they say. So she turns back and looks at the elevator, but when she comes back into the elevator, she, she kind of grabs onto the both sides of it, like she's trying to support herself. And they said that this would indicate either a lightheadedness or an emotional extreme. If she was supporting herself with both of her hands, it might indicate that she was lightheaded or that she was feeling an emotional extreme, like she's really excited or nervous about something. She does this hair preening. The last time she did it, her elbows were kind of out. Whereas now, when she's doing this hair preening thing, her elbows are parallel with her head, which would indicate that she's got a slight bit of anxiety. They said that it doesn't indicate fear, but it does indicate that she's trying to work up confidence for something because they said that usually when people do this, they're trying to be more confident, more robust, but they're not within themselves. So they're trying to work up to it. They also said that she's smiling in the video. Her arms begin flailing, which would suggest that she's either talking to someone and using hand gestures or she's playing out a future conversation that she's nervous about so had she met somebody at the bar who was just outside that elevator she might have been talking to them or which kind of seems more believable to me she was working up the courage to have a conversation with someone to ask someone something or to make a first move with something and she's actually rehearsing the conversation. I do that. I don't know if you do that, but if I'm nervous about something and I'm trying to work my courage up to do it, I do think about the conversation before it happens. And so they noted that. And had I not 
made that connection as to what I usually do, I might have not thought about that. And so I think that's really interesting. Nextly, they analyze her feet movements. So her right foot often comes up onto the top of her left foot. And they said that that usually reads as showing a significant amount of excitement, optimism, and it's usually associated with joy. So they've concluded their report saying that Elisa is playing hide and seek and her body language shows no fear, but a high level of sexual interest, playfulness, and a little bit of social anxiety. Now, something that I haven't mentioned in this video is that Elisa blogged a lot about social anxiety. It wasn't a new thing that she was socially anxious. So by them saying that she had a high level of interest in someone, she was being playful, but she was showing some social anxiety rather than, you know, when people said that, oh no, she's scared of someone and that's why she's acting that way. It's really interesting that they bring that up because she did have social anxiety and it does look like she's talking to someone, playing with someone, or she's working up the courage to have a particular conversation conversation with someone or make a move with someone. This report also says that whoever she was playing with, whoever was outside of that elevator or whoever she was, um, you know, maybe working up the courage to talk to must have been a permanent resident because the hotel is broken up into two different sections. She was on the 14th floor. So the upper section of the hotel is reserved for uh, actual residents of the hotel, people who are staying there long term. Whereas the bottom half of the hotel, which is where Elisa was staying, is reserved for hotel guests. Now, I don't know if Elisa was staying there originally in the bottom half of the hotel or when they moved her to a private room. Had they moved her to maybe a part of the hotel where they had some long-term guests because she did get her own private room after they complained about her. So was she invited up there by someone she met in the hotel bar who was a resident of the hotel or was she actually moved to a room up on those resident floors? Another thing that people did bring up about this video and I think this also might have been before they realized that the video had been slowed down so much but it is pretty strange that the elevator doors really didn't ever close. If you look closely, she's pressing all of the buttons below the floor that she's on. She's even pressing number 14, which actually is the floor that she's on. But because she's already on that floor, the button only lights up when her finger is on it. And when she takes her finger off, the light goes away, which would indicate that she is on the 14th floor, but she is pressing all the buttons below that. And below that is also the button to keep the door open. Once you press that button for this particular type of elevator, it will do a timer of two minutes and only after the two minutes will these particular doors close. I don't know who designed this elevator. I mean, it is an old elevator, I get it, but that's a really long time. The only way that the doors will close is if you press the door close button. So this specific elevator when you press the doors open button, we'll set a timer for two minutes and it will leave the doors open for that two minutes. Another person did bring up that maybe she was pressing all of the buttons and going in and out of the elevator because she wasn't wearing her glasses. Now, every picture we've seen of Elisa, usually she's wearing glasses. Some of them she's not, but usually she's wearing her glasses. We know that she wore glasses. I don't think that she was particularly blind, um, but this particular person said that maybe she couldn't see and that's why she was pressing all of the buttons to try and find the right floor. And she kept going out of the elevator to see if she was on the right floor or maybe there was something blocking the door or at least she thought something was blocking the door and that's why she was getting so worked up. I don't know. I tend to lean more toward the idea that there was someone outside of the hotel elevator and she was playing with them. Maybe someone who she had met who had invited her up onto the resident floors. I would believe that over that she just couldn't see because I don't think that she was like bat blind. Now, anytime a case like this happens, people always bring up the parents. Why aren't the parents crying more? Why aren't the parents doing this or that or this or that? Why haven't they commented? This is no exception. People have brought up the fact that Elisa Lam's family have never commented on this case. There are two reasons for that. First reason is because they are Chinese. 
um, when you come from a particularly conservative culture you're not used to being in front of cameras you're not used to being like where is my daughter whereas westerners are like where the heck is my daughter you know what i'm saying so that's a reason and then another reason is the fact that they had litigation against the Cecil Hotel and so it's likely that their lawyers would have been like please don't say anything let me handle it um, and that's just like the first rule of suing anyone is that you don't talk about it there is another theory um, and I <laughs> I'm gonna this is where I go down the rabbit hole because I'm gonna bring up the fact that the invisible light company was a company um, that had said that their address was at the Cecil Hotel. Now on Elisa's blog she did blog about Harry Potter and this is kind of where people have made the connection because remember in Harry Potter when they had the invisibility cloak thingo? People are saying that the Invisible Light Company was a company that was creating the invisibility cloak from Harry Potter and that's why you can't see the person that she was supposedly playing with or talking to outside of the elevator. Some people say that they can see a little black pixel show up in like literally a split set, like not even a full second of the footage and they're saying that that's where the invisibility cloak didn't work for a second. I don't know, but people are saying that the invisibility cloak theory. This does have some basis in truth because there is a Canadian company called Hyperself Biotechnology and they've actually been backed by the Pentagon to create an invisibility cloak. However, it's not the cloak from Harry Potter. They're saying that they, they do have working technology for this invisibility cloak um, and it has been confirmed that the Pentagon have backed it but they're not doing demonstrations for the public they're only doing select demonstrations and it is within the military so it does have some basis in truth but I don't think that it's connected to the Elisa Lamb case. One of the reasons that I don't think it's connected is because like what is the motive? Elisa Lamb was meant to check out that day. What would Hyper Stealth Biotech want to do with a 21 year old Canadian student who went on Tumblr and was about to check out? I just, it, that makes less sense to me. I mean, I'm not saying that it's completely impossible. I'm just saying that it's not a feasible theory for me um, for those reasons. Another thing that spooked a lot of people is that Elisa Lamb's Tumblr page continued posting even after her death. Um, it actually posted all the way up until December, which is a long way from January. That's almost a full year. But if you've never been on Tumblr before, you probably don't know this, but Tumblr has a scheduling system where you can schedule your posts to be, be released throughout the year. So if you don't feel like going on Tumblr, if you don't feel like posting anything, maybe you're traveling like she was, um, you can actually schedule your posts to be posted all throughout the year. So you've got content forever. Some people said that she was hacked. I think that she just scheduled her posts. Um, but either way, her entire Tumblr now has been archived. I did get access to some of the posts. They were quite interesting because she was a blogger. But the, the scheduled posts were just like GIFs pictures like fashion pictures but when you go uh, to the days before that she died she was actually blogging and writing about how nervous she was going out she did talk about how scared she was of ethnic men he also said that she lost her phone she got a new one there's yeah i mean nothing nefarious going on with her tumblr she just scheduled her posts and happened to die I will also say, and this might give a little bit of insight, as because a lot of people are like, did she know where she was staying? I have an, I, I, I have a motivation to believe that she did know about the Cecil Hotel, and I say this because in one of her Tumblr posts, she mentions the building next to the Cecil Hotel, and she's talking about how creepy it is, and she also mentioned the history of that building. So I'm assuming that she knew the history of the Cecil Hotel. Because if she googled the history of the building next to the Cecil Hotel, she likely would have gotten a lot of results for the building she was actually staying in. Because I would dare say that the Cecil Hotel has more of a history than this random building that just looks creepy that was next to it. So I'm going to say 
that I can assume that she knew about the Cecil Hotel. Now, the next theory that we're gonna go into is that Elisa was playing the Korean elevator game. Now, if you don't know about the Korean elevator game, it is where you get into a building that has more than 10 floors, it must have more than 10 floors, there's not allowed to be any other people in the elevator. You can't, it, it doesn't work if there are other people in the elevator. It has to be just you. You, there's literally so many steps. You have to go up to like the 10th floor, down to the first floor, down to the fifth floor, down to the second floor, down, like it's literally, there are way too many steps in this game for anyone to remember it without a phone, without like the, the amount of floors that you have to go to in which sequence written down with you because I, I read it and I was like how is anyone supposed to remember this to play this game but basically it is the same as Bloody Mary so in amongst all of these different steps you go to the fifth floor if a girl walks in to the elevator on the fifth floor you are not allowed to look at her and you're not allowed to talk to her and apparently this girl is gonna try and trick you into talking to her but if you do, she takes your soul. Why do people play this game if there's like a chance that a girl could kill them? People play this game because they think that it's gonna take them to the other world. So in amongst all of these steps, you go up to the 10th floor. On the 10th floor, if you don't talk to her, like usually she'll ask you a question of like, where are you going? If you get to the 10th floor, and you look outside and everything looks the same except the lights are off and there's a red cross in the distance. That's how you know you've reached the other world. The other world. Some people say that you know you've reached the other world if your electronics stop working. But other people say that they got there and that their electronics were working. And the rules say that if you lose consciousness at all during this time, if you faint, you pass out. You'll usually wake up in your home, but you have to make sure that it's your actual home and not the other world home because it might look different and you might not be able to get back. There's literally no instructions on how to get back if it's not your actual home. And so people say that Elisa Lam was playing the Korean elevator game and that she spoke to the little girl and something happened to her. The little girl took her soul. I can debunk this because I have actually seen the instructions on how to play the Korean elevator game and it is a sequence of floors that you're supposed to go to. First of all, it doesn't go past the 14th floor. Elisa was on the 14th floor. Second of all, Elisa was pressing all of the buttons below her floor. That is not how you play the game and so I, I can just debunk it by that. She's not playing the Korean elevator game. I think the pieces of interesting information which perplexed me the most is where is her phone I like I think that would likely solve it why was there sand all throughout her clothes who closed the lid why was there blood in her anal region and was the footage slowed down to make her look crazy or was it slowed down because they took time from it because both of those things were proven i know a lot of you were like what the hell ellie you're usually the logical one like you usually don't believe in these theories like i know and i'm like i'm sorry but i just don't believe that she committed suicide not only for the reasons that i've stated but also because she was a female and she was also from a culturally conservative background. Females generally do not undress themselves or put themselves on show or put themselves in a degrading manner before they die, before they kill themselves or commit suicide. She was naked and she was also from a conservative cultural background. And so if you're gonna kill yourself and she loved her family and she called her family every single day, I, I don't see her wanting to embarrass her family like that. I don't see her wanting to put them through more trauma by questioning whether or not she was raped because she was found naked. I don't see her actively saying, I'm gonna commit suicide, but I'm gonna do it in the worst way possible to put my family through hell and think that I got raped. That's also just not how females commit suicide. And so that's why I don't believe it's suicide on top of the plethora plethora on top of the plethora of information that i've already given you that's um also something to note as to why i don't believe it was suicide i also think it's really interesting that the rape kit was never processed and also the fact that there was blood 
in her anal region. I also think it's super interesting that the moments that were most needed on camera, the entire floor's camera system malfunctioned. Another thing that I think is really interesting is that this happened on the day that she was meant to check out of this hotel. Like literally the day that she tried to leave is when she went missing and died. The logical part of me thinks that a perpetrator was involved in her death. But there is also another side of me that is like, maybe the Cecil Hotel didn't want her to leave, you know? And I know that that's not logical, but that is just what's in the back of my mind because of all of these coincidences. Or maybe the perpetrator just didn't want her to leave and they decided to make their move and do what they had to do and kill her. There was also a heck ton of sex offenders that lived in the Cecil Hotel at the time, as in permanent residence. So, I mean, the logical part of me does say that a perpetrator did this. The bookstore clerk did say that Elisa looked like she was ready to leave that day. It didn't seem like anything was going on. It didn't seem like she was crazy. I don't think a little girl stole her soul and I don't think that there was someone in an invisibility cloak outside of the elevator door. I do think that Elisa Lam did have some mental health problems. I don't think that that led to her death. I do think that there was a perpetrator involved and because they knew or maybe had an inkling that this was the day that she was leaving, they decided to sodomize and kill her. I think that they put her body in that drum of water along with her belongings, but they kept her cell phone. And I really want to know where that cell phone is. Today, the Cecil Hotel is going under a $100 million renovation in an attempt to shake these conspiracies and in order to shake, once again, their reputation. When it reopens, it's becoming a 1.5k a month apartment block, but it is still the most haunted place in LA. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. It really does help. If you want to subscribe, I do a true crime Sunday every single Sunday. And then I also post during the week twice with things like hauls, challenges, story times, and just fun stuff like that. But every single Sunday, I do a true crime Sunday. Sunday. Leave a comment down below letting me know whether you think it was a crazy invisibility cloak thing. If you do think it was a suicide and maybe you can debunk my debunking of that theory. Or if you do think that someone was responsible for this. I really look forward to seeing your comments on this particular case. Um, remember, keep it respectful. Otherwise, I will turn off the comments just like I did with the Kanika Jenkins case. But I trust that you guys are gonna keep it respectful and not let me down on this one. But anyway, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.